so welcome to day two of e EALE. Uh, we are um, starting things off with uh, Mike Anderson. Uh, now his slides were just added to the CM website, the cm.e-ale.org website. Uh, so they're not currently on your USB key. However, if you put your USB key in and mount it under your Linux machine, uh, your VM, or uh, if you're running natively, there is an updater script uh, in, in the, the root of it called update.sh. Uh, makes sense. If you actually run that, it will, in fact, sync the latest slides and everything off the website onto your uh, key. It's, uh, it's all done through rsync. In fact, you could do it yourself if you really wanted to, but the, sc the script is, in fact, there. Um, that will allow you to see his slides. Otherwise, his slides are live on the website, so you can see them there uh, and follow along. Um, Mike is an interesting person. He's done an awful lot of interesting things, and uh, if you caught, uh, sadly, many of you were here yesterday and probably missed his reverse engineering uh, uh, talk, but uh, when it comes to taking random hardware and figuring out how it works, um, there are very few people that uh, can do it better than Mike. So having him here doing the debugging uh, talk is uh, is pretty special, so uh, I, I will pass it over to you. Get this, uh, there we go, there we got the mic up. Okay, yes, uh, so as uh, Bayan says, my name is Mike Anderson. Uh, I've been in the industry now, last year was 40 years. So I have seen everything from big mainframes. Uh, my first microcomputer was an Intel 8080 running at a whopping two megahertz in an Altair 8800. So uh, definitely uh, go back a long ways. Uh, Linux, I started using Linux in about 2000, so it's been about 17, 18 years now. And uh, I do kernel development and uh, of course I also do a lot of reverse engineering, things of that sort. Uh, I live in Linux, I switched over to Linux completely uh, about uh, 15 years ago and uh, it was really painful back then because laptops didn't have a whole lot of support in those days. But uh, fortunately it's gotten quite a bit better and uh, I'm, I'm happy that uh, I run Linux because of the stability of, of it, of course. Uh, and then when I absolutely, positively have to, I have a Windows VM if I actually need that. And unfortunately, WebEx, I do a lot of stuff on WebEx, and WebEx really only works in a Windows world, so kind of a nuisance. But in any case, for this particular session, what we are going to talk about is we are going to deal with uh, GDB and some of the auxiliary parts associated with GDB. So we're gonna talk about the GNU project and the GNU compiler collection, uh, which is uh, the capital GCC. Uh, we'll get into native versus cross debugging. We'll talk about compiling for debugging, what flags we have to turn on and which ones mean what. Uh, there are actually are multiple different levels in the debug stuff. Uh, we'll look at GDB from the CLI perspective. We'll look at it from the uh, text user interface or the TUI interface. Uh, we'll also look at some of the graphical G GDB front ends. Then we'll look at uh, how we get, once we start up GDB, we'll get in, we have to understand how we get the help system up. Uh, we'll take a look at scripts and macros. Uh, we'll uh, deal with launching an application, uh, loading and running applications, and then of course attaching to a running application. That is uh, it, in and of itself kind of an interesting thing. Uh, we will then hit uh, breakpoints, watch points, catch points, uh, there's a few other things we'll talk about in that particular section. Uh, we'll do, then we'll take a look at the true cross-debugging environment where we're using GDB server and, of course, some of its options. And then we'll finish up by talking a little bit about kernel debugging, uh, what you have to do in order to set up for KGDB, the kernel version of GDB, and what the lash up looks like and exactly how you load code and then get the symbols in there and all that sort of stuff. So a lot of stuff to cover in this particular, um, uh, this particular amount of time. So we'll do the best we can to kind of buzz through this for those of you who may have uh, some experience with this. How many of you have ever used GDB? A good number of you. Some of you go, eh. Um, believe me, there are, uh, every time I get into GDB, I find something else that I've never seen before. And it's like, where did that come from? What, where did that function come from? And who thought of that function? That's kind of a weird thing for it to do. Um, but nonetheless, GDB is, uh, an incredibly powerful debugger. It has a lot of different options for basically being able to handle um, different languages and, of course, different scenarios. Uh, 
So uh, if we take a look at the original GNU project, its ostensible goal was to create a Unix clone without any AT&T sources, and that's why GNU is GNU's not Unix. It's a recursive uh, acronym, uh, which uh, they thought it was kind of cool at the time. Now, uh, there is, of course, the, uh, the GCC compiler, that is lowercase GCC. Uh, that is the original C compiler, and of course, that was developed uh, pretty much out of the box because we needed to have a way of being able to develop code for low-level machines. And C, of course, oftentimes is considered to be a mid-level language, not really a high-level language. Um, I use C most of the time for almost all my stuff. Uh, I will occasionally use C++ if I have to. Uh, but up in the kernel, you can do anything you want in the kernel as long as it's C or assembler. So it kind of narrows your uh, focus there. Uh, in the case of uh, G++, uh, that of course is the C++ compiler. Uh, they also have uh, front-end language parsers, back-end code generators. This is all part of GCC. Uh, that is the capital GCC, which is the GNU compiler collection. So the GNU compiler collection actually encompasses C, C++, Objective-C, Fortran, Ada, and Go. Uh, have libraries associated with that. They used to do Java, they don't do Java anymore. GCJ was dropped out of the GCC collection last year. Uh, so Java is no longer in that block. But uh, Ada, of course, very popular, the GNAT Ada, uh, very popular on the uh, 787. Uh, many of the aircraft, the, seven, the, the 777 uses GNAT Ada. Uh, several of the aircraft that we fly on a regular basis, uh, if we do any traveling, all use GNU tools and GNAT ADA. So it is uh, community supported, peer reviewed. Uh, there is a lot of support from the major silicon manufacturers and this is one of the key things, especially for the ARM architecture. Um, when you take a look at uh, ARM, of course there are a lot of different ARM compilers, IIR, Kyle, uh, the GCC compiler, Intel has a C compiler. All these different manufacturers have C compilers and uh, it turns out that the GCC is supported by ARM Limited, or what used to be ARM Limited, now they're owned by SoftBank. But uh, it's supported by ARM. And what they have said, and the, and the folks that I've spoken with say, if you find a piece of code that works better, better, in one of the other compilers, report it to us. Tell us what it is, tell us the compiler, the version, tell us why you think it's better, and if we believe you, then we will fix GCC to make it happen. So I've had very good luck in the past with make, getting them to make changes, and uh, it usually turns around pretty quickly, and that's one of the other things about the GCC compiler system. Uh, it is a fairly quick turnaround in changes. So I mean, over the past 30 some odd years that I've been using GCC, I have found maybe three or four legitimate bugs, and they were usually fixed within a week. So uh, not, not too bad. Certainly you can't claim that about a lot of different compiler environments. Now GDB is the GNU debugger and it was built as a source debugger for GCC. And because it's the capital GCC, it actually supports ADA, assembly, C and C++, Fortran, et cetera. Now uh, for those of you who think, oh, Fortran's an ancient language, uh, there was recently an advertisement from NASA looking for Fortran programmers because it turns out that some of the satellites, like the one that just went by Pluto, all the programming was done in Fortran. And it was launched, of course, umpty ump years ago. So they have to try and find somebody that has uh, that kind of experience. So if you, uh, well, yeah, for those of us who are, you know, gray, uh, we, we, I started with Fortran uh, 74, well, Fortran 4, and then went to 74, and then ultimately 77. But, um, of course, that kind of tells you how long ago that was. But in any case, um, GDB is a great debugger for many, many different languages, including Modular 2 and Pascal. Of course, they just recently added Rust. If you're interested in any of those languages, the same things that we're going to be doing here in this class will apply to those languages as well. It was designed to run from a CLI, but because of the way it was designed, it's easy to graft a graphical user environment on top of it. So we can put a GUI on top of it. It turns out it works with Eclipse, it works with uh, KDevelop, it works with, um, so even, I've even seen some versions running under Microsoft Visual Studio, uh, 
So there are lots of different places where we can see the GDB environment, and it really does kind of cut across uh, different environments. We see it on the Mac, we see it on the Windows, we see it on Linux, uh, FreeBSD, NetBSD, et cetera. So all of those are going to be uh, available to us as potential platforms. Now, part of the issue that we have, get in, have to get into when we're dealing with, uh, certainly since this is an, an embedded environment that we're working with here with the Pocket Beagle, is native versus cross debugging. Now, given that a lot of the processors that we have today are relatively powerful, I mean, we're talking 600, 700, 800, up to a gigahertz or faster, uh, they've got 256 megs of RAM, um, they have their own file system with ECC memory, uh, all of that uh, is really great. I mean, that's fantastic to be able to do that because that means that we can then just kind of literally log into the target and run our debuggers, run our compilers and things of that sort. Um, however, it turns out that even with that additional performance and power, uh, we actually still find ourselves needing to use the cross-development environment. And that is using a cross-compiler, using cross-debuggers, being able to debug the code remotely on the target, uh, especially if the target is not located in any nice friendly area. Uh, I've had cases where the target was on Kwajalein Atoll, uh, and it's out in the middle of the Pacific, and trust me, you don't want to have to go to Kwajalein Atoll. It takes a long time to get there, and it's a, it's a hellish place. It's just an island <laughs> and nothing else there. I, I think they do have a tree. Uh, they have at least one of those. But um, it is, uh, if you can do debugging remotely, that is if you have a network connection to the target, you really want to do that. You don't want to have to uh, uh, sit there and have to go physically there to try and do some debug. Of course, cross debugging does add connection latency because we've got the latency of the network involved. Uh, it does add a little bit more complexity, but it turns out that a lot of the GUIs actually understand the cross debug environment and make it fairly simple. So we'll see how that uh, looks in just a bit. Now, in order for us to compile for debugging, understand that uh, the uh, object module output from the compiler is ELF, embedded in linking format or executable linking format. Uh, the compiler, the, the mechanism for doing debugging is called DWARF. And DWARF also stands for something, I don't remember what, exactly what it is, but that's the DWARF debugging logo there. Uh, and in order for us to be able to turn on debugging support inside of the compiler so that the debugging support is now in the actual executable, uh, we use the dash G option. Now, it turns out there's not just one dash G, there's a whole bunch of dash, dash Gs, and we need to kind of understand which ones do what in order to get a better idea of exactly which one we should be using for what application. So, if we look at the different debug levels, they have a dash G0, which basically turns the debugger off. I'm not quite sure why you would go to the trouble of actually typing dash G0 when you could just not put it there and it would do the same thing. But if you were in a script, something like that, okay, maybe, maybe that makes sense. They're using an environment variable to set the debug level. I can certainly see a case for that. Uh, dash G1 produces minimal information. Basically, it's okay for backtraces, uh, there's really no information about local variables, no line numbers. Uh, so it's a little bit of debugging, but not a whole lot. Uh, dash G2, this is the default. So if you do dash G, you'll get dash G2 is the, is the debug level. Typically this has symbols, line numbers, uh, whatever is needed for symbolic debugging. All of that is incorporated with dash G2. And then dash G3 is the one that includes a lot of extra information, macro definitions present in the program. Uh, we see all of the, basically if it's in the code, in the source code, we'll see it in the debugger output. Now, when you turn on this debug, if you use this, the typical dash G, it'll add about 30% to the size of the executable. And the reason is because it creates the debug sections, it creates the comment sections, there's a whole bunch of additional ELF sections that get created and tacked onto the executable. But there's a cool thing in that if I simply have access to a debug version of the code, I don't have to run the debug version on the target. I can actually take the code, compile it with no debugging, load that to the target, small size. I can then take the exact same code, add dash G, and then I can load that into the debugger and connect to the target 
and I can actually debug code on the target without having the target running debug enabled code. So this is really handy when you go to debug the kernel because you don't want to stick 30% extra worth of code out there in the kernel space that eats up a lot of memory. So definitely being able to do something like this where we're not required to actually have the debug code on the target saves us a lot of time and effort. We'll get into more details on that one later. So here's an example compile for GDB. We're just simply using the cross compiler here, arm-linux-gnu-evi-gcc. Um, of course, the cross compilers, if you're using any of the Debian distributions, Ubuntu or any uh, Linux Mint, I run Mint, uh, but if you're using any of those, if you go out to Synaptic, you can do an app get and install uh, the GCC cross compilers for the, GNU, for the ARM architecture. Uh, they do have cross compilers for other architectures, but we're using ARM here, so we'll stick with that one. Um, alternatively, you can go out to uh, Lenaro, uh, lenaro.org, and Lenaro produces the compilers that uh, actually Ubuntu uses. So when you go out to Lenaro, you can download the latest compiler chain and then uh, unload it, basically, untar it into your op directory and then set up some paths. And you'll be able to use the latest and greatest compiler out of the Lenaro folks. Now, when we do the compile, you'll notice here we did an obj dump and the obj dump has then all the different segments that are associated with it. All of these are related to debugging. So there's quite a few extra pieces that get added to the executable output because we've enabled debugging. And this is what we can do. We can get rid of this by simply using the stripped command. The stripped command will take all this stuff out, but uh, when we're obviously, once you've stripped it, you can't really debug it all that well, unless you like working in assembly language. Uh, <laughs> yeah, sorry, woo, yeah, assembly language. Uh, now, running the GDB CLI, uh, this, of course, allows me, because of the way GDB is created, and the whole GNU compiler chain for that matter, uh, we have a front end that is targeted at a particular operating system and or CPU architecture, and we have a back end, which is actually the code generator. So we can have a Windows cross Linux, uh, x86 host cross ARM target, uh, we can have Linux cross Linux, Mac OS cross Linux, all those sorts of combinations and permutations are available to you. Um, there is a tool called uh, uh, Cross Tool NG, and what it does is you download it, you specify what kind of compiler and bin utils and everything you're interested in, and it'll automatically download the source code and build that for you. Now, it takes about an hour or so to download everything and build it on a reasonably fast machine uh, compared to the, my very first use of the GNU compiler and GDB. I had to build all that myself. It took about a week to figure out how to download it, construct it, uh, get it to compile. You had to do a stage one compiler and then the stage one compiler compiled the stage two compiler and then that finally made the production compiler. It took a long time to do all of that. With cross tool ng, uh, we can produce the compiler in a matter of an hour or so. Uh, or better yet, just go out to the repository and download the compiler and uh, use that uh, a lot faster. Now, from the CLI, of course, GDB was originally developed to run from a CLI, and when we run it, it is ugly. I'm sorry for the folks who created GDB, the output of this is ugly. Um, uh, just a personal opinion, of course, but uh, this one happens to be from an x86 platform. Uh, it's uh, Ubuntu 7. Well, the, the version that we're using, uh, GCC 7.11, uh, and it, uh, it's a pretty nice cool, it's a pretty cool thing. I mean, some of the things that they added to GCC that we won't get a chance to talk about in this particular class, uh, with GCC version seven, they actually added the ability to run backwards. So you can get to a point where you've got a bug and you can actually start stepping backwards in the code. Uh, and it undoes what it did, uh, which is kind of cool. Um, but uh, you know, we're not going to get an opportunity to mess around with that in this particular class. That uh, gets into some really advanced debugging stuff. But it's definitely the fact that it can do that is kind of cool. Now, when we're running GDB, uh, obviously we probably don't want to run in this mode. So we want to be able to run in something that's a little bit more easy for us to uh, figure out what's going on. So it turns out that GDB in its normal command line mode has something called text user interface mode or TUI mode. TUI mode is a text-based user interface that basically takes the code and the GDB command line and separates it into two separate pieces. 
So it looks a lot like some of the graphical debuggers in the sense that you have uh, the, the code in one place that you can see, and you can set breakpoints and move around in the code, and then you have the GDB command line that you can control. So uh, that is kind of a, a cool solution, and we'll be using one of those in the lab uh, when we get started. But it's probably not as friendly as using a GUI, but it's better than using the command line straight up. And this will work on any window that has uh, cursor positioning in it. So if I'm using SSH, it works in SSH, it works in a Telnet window, uh, anything that I have a connection, even it even works in Minicom. So interestingly enough, you have a lot of different options to get here. Well, uh, you can start GDB in TUI mode. Uh, some versions of GDB have an actual command line called dash TUI. If you start it in that mode, it automatically starts up in TUI mode. Alternatively, if we started it up in command line mode and we forgot to add the, the flag, whatever, we can then do a control X A, and that key sequence will then switch it to TUI mode. And then if you do control X A again, it'll switch it back to CLI mode. So you can kind of go in and out of CLI mode if you really needed to do that. The GUIs that are available, there are a lot of them for GCC, or for GDB rather. Um, the one that's the official GUI is called DDD, the Data Display Debugger. Uh, we'll be playing around with this one in the lab. The other ones that you see, of course, Insight, that was developed by Red Hat. It's an MDI GUI approach, so there's multiple windows inside of a window, uh, as opposed to just a single uh, window environment. Uh, the IDEs that support GDB in the back end, uh, we have, of course, Code, Code Warrior from uh, the guys that, let's see, they were Freescale, then they became NXP. They were supposed to become Qualcomm, but somebody in the administration just nixed that deal, so we'll see if they actually become Qualcomm at some point. But they've had this tool called Code Warrior, and those of you who date really far back on the Mac, you know that in the original Mac, before this is like Macintosh uh, style Macs, the little bitty Macs, uh, they actually ran Code Warrior. That was the primary development environment for the Mac. So Code Warrior's still around, uh, and it turns out that the NXP guys still sell it. Um, but, and, and it's focused right now on their particular silicon parts. So it's not a general purpose compiler debugger now, it's really kind of focused on their parts. Uh, of course, Ariba, KDevelop, Eclipse, uh, and Slick Edit. Um, Slick Edit, I use Slick Edit if I'm gonna be doing any serious editing, if I'm gonna be in the editor for a long time, I'll use Slick Edit. It is a commercial editor, uh, it does cost money, but they have versions for Linux, they have versions for Windows, and they have versions for Mac OS. Um, I think they got one for Mac OS, I'm pretty sure they do. And uh, it's, it's a great little editor. Uh, if you are married to Eclipse, then there's also a Slick Edit plugin for Eclipse that you can then get and get all the stuff, all the goodness out of Slick Edit uh, in the uh, actual editor. But whatever editor you happen to like doesn't really matter as far as GDB is concerned. Uh, if we happen to have an IDE that supports GDB, great. We can do all the things inside of the IDE and we never have to leave it. If that is not your case, then by all means jump out to the command line. So now if we take a closer look at the DDD front end, uh, we have, of course, DDD itself supports not only GDB, but it also supports JDB, which is the Java debugger, Python, Perl, Tickle, and PHP debugging. So the front end has the ability to talk to a back end, and the back end can be one of these other environments. You can automatically load the application at invocation. So when you run GDB, you can say GDB space, or DDD space, name of the program, and it'll automatically load the program for you. Um, we can also start DDD with a dash debugger option. And the dash debugger option allows me to specify a different back end. So if I'm gonna be doing cross debugging, where I'm on an x86, debugging on the ARM, I would do something like DDD-debugger, ARM, Linux, blah, 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 and then the application, and it would then run the ARM backend with the GDB front end and the, uh, the DDD GUI of, uh, on top of that. So <clears throat> the GUI itself, a little bit closer look here. Uh, we have the code window, and of course, in this case, we're seeing some uh, breakpoints in there. We see the GDB command line. And then we have this little floating window that, move, that you can move around that has the basic commands. Run, uh, we see step, uh, next, and we'll talk about all these commands and what they do here when we get to that point. 
but it's a, a, a good general purpose sort of uh, GUI interface. Looks a little dated because it was originally developed back in the original X Windows Athena toolkit uh, where you had some pretty old widgets back then. But uh, it, it's, it's an oldie, but it's a goodie. It, 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 works, it works really, really reliably. Now, when we get into GDB, if we go into the command line part of GDB, then there's an extensive help system in there. So if there's something we need to know about, if we need to know about breakpoints, we can type help space breakpoints. If we want to know about uh, catch points or watch points or any of those things, they have help files online in GDB to be able to help you. So you don't have to rush out to the GDB manual every time you turn around. Most of the documentation is right there inside of the application. You can also, and this is something that a lot of folks don't know about, uh, you can use the command apropos and the word, whatever it is you're looking for, and it will look through all of the help files to find, uh, where, to find commands that entail that word. Basically, you're looking for uh, apropos break file, breakpoint, and it'll show you all the commands that have anything to do with breakpoints. So it is a nice thing if you have never messed around with apropos in the Linux world, Apropos also ha is available in Linux. We can use that to do an apropos and it'll search through all the manual pages. So definitely, if you're not quite sure what the command is, but you know it's got something to do with, say, breakpoints, then apropos breakpoints and it'll show you every command that has anything to do with breakpoints. So uh, throughout uh, this help output and when we're actually using GDB, we'll have it uh, reference things like the inferior. Uh, the inferior is not a comment on your code, although it might be, it depends on you, I guess. Um, it, is, ha it has to do with the way GDB actually runs executables. So when you're running an executable in the GDB sense, GDB is in control of the application that you're running. So GDB is the superior, your application is the inferior. You'll see things like inferior has exited, that kind of comment that comes out on GDB occasionally. And that's usually when the application has terminated, the inferior uh, has exited. So now here's an example of some of the help output. I see it's a, probably a little difficult for you folks in the back, uh, but uh, this shows me the list of classes of commands. I see breakpoints, files, internals, uh, running applications, the stack, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this is what happens when you just type help. And then you can get more and more specific. You can do help breakpoints, and then you can say help hardware breakpoints getting more and more specific as you go along. The, uh, another thing that you have as kind of an interesting capability inside of GDB is the ability to do command definition and macros. So you've got a sequence of events that you type a lot and you're tired of typing them individually. What you would like to do is you'd like to uh, create your own command and then execute one command and it does everything that you've been typing. Uh, this is done through the define command so you type define in the name of the command that you want to call it, and then it will say, okay, type your commands, and then when you're finished, type end on a single line all by itself, and then that will record that as a defined command. Uh, another thing that you can do, once you've defined these commands, you can now save them and reuse them later. So you don't have to go basically typing in these commands every single time you start GDB. GDB does have a .gdb init, which allows it to be run and uh, source everything inside the .gdb init when it comes up. Uh, you can then add additional commands and all of that has the capability to handle all of that. Uh, additionally, if you're going to write a command, of course you're gonna write documentation for that command. Uh, so there is a document command and the document, you say document in the name of the macro that you just created and the name of the command you just created and then you can actually type in the documentation for it and then type in on the last line and it'll be added to the documentation for GDB. So if anybody comes along later and says, oh hey, what was that special command you created? And then they go, how does that work? You can just do uh, help space and the special command and it'll then produce all the help output that you've obviously documented in here. There is another mechanism, Your question? Yeah, where does it save all that? Uh, wherever you want it to. Now, by, by default, it'll save it in, uh, where does that go? In, a, in the .config directory, I think. Uh, but you can direct it to other places. So it doesn't have to be in whatever the default is. You can send it anywhere. 
Yeah. Ah, like, uh, for instance, in the case of kernel debugging, one of the things we want to do is we want to load the symbol file of the kernel module that we're actually trying to debug. So in cases like that, we may have breakpoints that we want to set. So for instance, if I'm debugging the kernel, I'm going to set breakpoints on sync and on uh, kernel oops and panic. So there's a whole bunch of things that I would normally type in if I'm going to be doing kernel debugging. I can then save all of that as a command and just type the one command, kernel debug, and it sets all that stuff up for me. So it's basically just a repetitive mechanism. It's a way to avoid having to do repetitive things. If you have to type in a series of commands every single time, that gets old after a while. So we can just define it as a command and save it that way. Question? Okay, is, is what you're gonna teach, does that also cover debugging with GDB and U-boot? Or just primarily, primarily kernel, kernel? Well, well we're, we're primarily looking at user space and kernel space, but it turns out that a lot of the things we're talking about here work just fine with U-boot. With U so especially the cross debug environment will work fine there. So we'll kind of touch on that, although I don't specifically have U-boot called out here uh, because we were um, defining this for user space and kernel space, but a lot of the things that we'll see actually do apply uh, when you're using uh, GDB to talk to U-boot. Um, now, normally when I'm talking to U-boot through GDB, I'm talking to it through a JTAG. So if I got a JTAG, I'll do an attach to the JTAG, I'll then run the JTAG, and I can do all of that from GDB. So that is normally how I debug U-boot uh, bootloaders. But sometimes you don't have that luxury. Maybe you don't actually have access to a JTAG for that particular processor core. Uh, there may be other issues that get into play there. But it is possible uh, to use uh, all these things in GDB that we'll talk about straight up with uh, things like U-boot. And that's where you would also take advantage of these uh, command definitions. Because when you're setting up a debug on U-boot, there's a whole bunch of addresses, and you gotta whack some I squared C register, and there's a whole bunch of other things that you need to do, and you don't wanna have to type that in every single time. Because when you're trying to debug U-boot, it's gonna crash a lot. I mean, if you're, if you're bringing it up the first time, it's gonna crash a lot. So you don't wanna have to type that crap in every time. So it's a great way of being able to save a lot of typing. Now, GDB scripts in general, um, there is, of course, I mentioned .gdb init, um, this is the startup script that's going to execute every time GDB starts. Um, definitely useful for getting that environment ready and set up for you to start your debug. Uh, but it also has a dash X option in the GDB invocation that allows me to specify additional external scripts. So if I want to do something, it could be one of these cases where I CD into a directory where I'm doing a, a dedicated debug of uh, something like a um, you know, user application, and I have a script in there that's specific to that user application. Or I go into another directory and I have a completely different script for a completely different set of debug. So having the dash X option gives me the option of being able to uh, customize the environment a little bit for that particular invocation of GDB. Uh, in order for us to examine code, obviously if we've loaded an application, one of the first things we want to do is look at it. So we have the command list, and the list command has several different options associated with it. I can list a line number, I can list a file at a particular line number, I can list a function name, I can list a file with a function name, or I can list an address, which is kind of interesting. If you've ever used the adder to line command in the uh, uh, object, uh, in the bin utils tools, uh, you've got a, uh, say, a segmentation violation, segmentation fault. It gives you an address. Well, what you'd like to be able to do is you'd like to be able to do that address to a line of code. What is that address? That's what adder to line does for you. And in this particular case, we can then list at addresses uh, without having to do adder to line. If we just know what the address is, we can load it into GDB, specify the address that we want to list, and it'll show me the code that corresponds to that address. So that's definitely handy, especially if you get obscure uh, dumps in, at memory locations and you're not quite sure what they are. By default, when you do a list, it's gonna show you 10 lines. If you have a really big screen, maybe that's not enough for you. So we can use the set list size command and that will allow me to change the number of lines that it displays by default. Now, when I'm doing development, uh, my machine at home, uh, well, I, I use the, my laptop here it is a um, quad-core 
Pentium Xeon E3 series part, 32 gigs of RAM, two and a half terabytes of solid state. So it compiles pretty quickly for the most part, especially when I'm doing builds of Android. Uh, Android take for, uh, takes forever to build. So when I'm doing big builds like that, but when I'm at home, I plug into my monitor. It's a 35 inch uh, 4K monitor. And um, having something that big is really what you need if you're gonna be using Eclipse. Because Eclipse is a screen real estate pig. All the little tabs and everything that it has takes up a lot of space. I actually have seen people try to run Eclipse on a 1024 by 768 screen, and I laugh at them uh, because it's so incredibly painful for them to figure out where anything is in the Eclipse on that kind of screen. But if you have a big screen, certainly you can change the list size uh, to get a little bit more, take a little bit more advantage of all that extra screen real estate that you've got. Of course, there are a buttload of internal settings in GDB. So if you're really interested in uh, which settings are out there, um, I uh, would encourage you to use the command show all by itself on the GDB command line. And you'll see about 200 options that scroll by. Um, each one of them, if you then said help, show, and then the name of the command, it would then tell you what that command actually does. Uh, there are a lot of options that you can then, if you have done the show on an option, you can also do a set on the option to change its value. And one of the ones that I will frequently use is set output radix 16. That'll mean that all the outputs come in hex instead of in decimal. Decimal doesn't do me a whole lot of good for the most part when I'm dealing with the memory addresses. I want to see it in hex. So using set output radix 16 will automatically display everything in hex for me. There's also a set input radix 16 or eight or whatever it is you want to do. If you set it to set input radix to 10, it goes in decimal mode, unless you specify with 0x or some other modifier out there. But this will just set the default radix to something that is a little bit more reasonable, 16 being uh, hex. Now, when we want to load and execute the code, if you don't load the program on the command line, so normally it'll be GDB or DDD and the name of the command, but if you didn't do that for whatever reason, you can always use the command file and the file name. And it will then load the file into memory as well as all of the debugging symbols. So assuming that the, the file was compiled for debugging, you'll then see the debugging symbols as well. Um, once the code's loaded into GDB, you execute it by simply using the run command. And if you have parameters that you have to pass to it, you can type run, space, parameter, 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 no commas, just separated by spaces. Uh, if, on the other hand, this is something that you're trying to do regression testing on, or you're gonna be running the application multiple times, then it's useful to use the set args command, where we can set all the arguments to what we want them to be, and then it'll always use those arguments every time we run. Uh, we can also do a show args to see what those arguments are set for our particular implementation. So now, calling functions, this is something that a lot of people don't know that GDB can do. If I have loaded an application, I can call the functions interactively in that application. So I, the syntax and the parameter passing matches whatever language you happen to be using. So if you're using Ada, it's one way. If it's using C or C++, it's a different. But in any case, I can then interactively, if I have a function called print array, I can just simply type print array open close open paren, close paren, and it'll call it and execute it right there. So I don't have to be in the middle of a run with a breakpoint. I can simply run the application and run little bits and pieces of the application to see if they're doing what I think they're doing. So it allows me to kind of divide and conquer on the debug strategy, so I don't have to debug the whole program at once. I can debug little bits and pieces as we go. We can uh, also set register variables. So if we happen to have registers that we're mucking around with, especially if we're passing from user space into kernel space, where we're gonna be passing on the register, stat, uh, register set, um, we have the ability to then set um, register values. If I have a variable and I wanna change the variable, I can do set variable equals expression. So it isn't just a number, you can actually do complex expressions, you can do math and things of that sort in it. Um, and it's whatever the equivalent is for your language. In the case of C, it's var equals expression. So if I had a, a value in the program called test or debug, let's say debug, uh, 
So I can then say set debug equals one, and that would then turn on the debugger for that particular session. So any variable that's visible in the current uh, stack frame, and that includes globals, of course, uh, will be settable using this command se sequence. If the variable exits scope, and the variable has any persistence in its scope, when you come back into scope, the variable will still have that value set. Yeah, question? A register value, even if that register doesn't exist, like if you're operating inside a VM to confuse things? <laughs> if you're running inside of a traditional VM, then no. If you're trying to set, for instance, the ARM uh, register seven, and there is no register seven in your x86 VM, clearly you're not gonna be able to do that. But if you're running in QMU, on the other hand, you can. So if you're running inside a QMU, you'll actually be able to, because it's emulating the instruction set of the processor that you're actually running the code for. Uh, and that's actually how I did a lot of the stuff for uh, the debug labs that we'll get into. Uh, and unfortunately, the Pocket Beagle doesn't have all of the packages that we need to have in order to be able to do debugging. So it's kind of a chicken and egg problem. Uh, let's see in a second. Uh, it, it's a, the problem is that my Pocket Beagle interfaces through the USB. How do I get the Pocket Beagle to go all the way out to the internet, download a package, and bring it all the way back, right? That's not easy to do. It's not impossible, but it takes a lot more thought than I really want to put into it. So I just simply started a QMU session that was running ARM HF as the architecture, and then downloaded the packages in the ARM HF architecture, and then copied them over to the Pocket Beagle using SFTP. And it made it really easy to work with. Uh, yeah, question. Ah, yes. How did, how did, the question is, how does it handle things like C++ name demangling? And mangling, as the case may be. It understands completely how the demanglers work. So you can reference it as the actual variable name, and then it will recognize that it's C++, and it'll handle all the mangling for you. So you don't have to ha append the scope and all the other crazy stuff that C++ does. So yeah, it's got the demanglers in it. So that's uh, really kind of cool, uh, and it also turns out that uh, some cases, there are gonna be cases where we'll have a variable that happens to have the exact same name as a command in GDB. Uh, let's say I had a variable called breakpoint. Well, obviously that's a command in GDB. So how do I set the variable breakpoint and not mess around with the command breakpoint? Well, it turns out they have a syntax for that as well. Set variable, name of the variable breakpoint equals expression. You'll be able to get past that particular problem. So now printing expression, yes, question. Well, so the program is loaded. The executable is there, and you can actually invoke it. So you can run it, obviously, and that'll come in through main, and you'll run the C runtime and all the setup and everything. If you have something that has to have the C runtime involved with it, then you'll have to run it. If you have just a function that you want to call, then you can actually just call the function directly. As long as it has access to um, the globals or whatever it is that were symbols inside of the, um, the application itself, you'll be able to run. If you have to pass it parameters, you can actually pass it parameters too. So you can do that as well. So yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely, that's one of those, oh, I didn't know it could do that kind of thing. Uh, now printing expressions, uh, the primary mechanism of course that uh, we'll run into a lot in uh, GDB is we have a variable and we wanna see what the value is right now. So, uh, and it could potentially be out of scope I mean, it could be in another stack frame someplace, and I need to be able to go into that stack frame to be able to see it. Uh, we'll see how, the, how to manipulate the stack frames here in just a moment. But uh, we have the print command, and we can print an expression. And the expression, actually, it has the ability, remember I said it talked, I talked about the ability to run things backwards? Well, it actually keeps track of old variable copies. So we can use $num, and it will pick up the last version of that variable. I can do dollar dollar num and it'll go to the, the second to the last version of it. So there also are ways for me to be able to get all the way back to the beginning of the variable's history. Uh, we can also take a look at address expressions. So for instance, if I wanted, if I got a pointer and the pointer is pointing at something, I wanna see what the something is, I can do print star pointer name and it'll dereference the value. 
and I'll be able to see what the pointer is actually pointing to. Uh, now, one of the things that GDB doesn't do terribly well is um, decoding complex structures uh, if I'm using print. If I'm using display, then it'll actually show me the, the structure and I'll actually see the structures it lays out in memory. Um, but if I just do a print, star, whatever the name of the structure is, it'll just show me the raw data, basically. And that may be what you want, in many cases it is, but oftentimes it's not. Um, there is also another mechanism that is the at sign symbol. That's a binary uh, operator for treating consecutive objects in memory as an array. So let's say I have an array called address, and inside of the array I have a whole bunch of numbers. What I want to be able to do is I could say print star address. That would then um, just show me the address of the array. But if I did print address at sign, and then the number of elements in the array, it'll actually show me the entire array. So I have that capability as well. Yes, question? Uh, yeah, it's kind of interesting how you have a history on the variables. So, uh, so I'm wondering, okay, so you're freely running and then you hit a break point and then you can go back even though, even though you didn't look at those previous values in the debugger. Mm -hmm. Okay, so is there any way to correlate those with something else happening, sort of like an emulator? So say, uh, you know, say you're, you're resetting or your program counter goes through zero or something weird like that. Can you actually do an expression to actually show, you know, dollar, dollar, dollar num with, you know, like dollar, dollar, dollar um, program counter or something like that? That is something I don't know the answer to right offhand, uh, but I'm sure that uh, if that is something that a programmer would normally want to do, GDB probably does it. Uh, but I don't know specifically whether that is implemented. All around? Okay. No. Nope. Okay. All right. Now, there's another mechanism that we have in the print. We can actually use a format modifier. So let's assume that we want to print an address, but what we're interested in is we're interested in the low order word or the high order word of that address. So we can actually use these format mechanisms to show me a byte, a word, a D word, a quad word, all those sorts of things so I can represent the data at that address using one of these format specifiers. Uh, they also, uh, in, in these, um, oh, excuse me, I'm getting ahead of myself, that's actually with the X command. Um, these format letters for print, we can show it as an octal, hex, decimal, unsigned decimal, binaries, floats, addresses, instructions, and characters, uh, strings, and hex zero padded on the left. So uh, when we're getting ready to do a print, we can do print, slash and x, that will then put it in, oct in hex, the name of the variable that we want to print, and it'll then show it to us in hex. So even if we don't have our output rate set to hex, we can specify what we want to see it in. Do we want to see it in decimal? Do we want to see it in hex? Do we want to see it in binary? Um, there is, of course, the, also the ability to dereference addresses, as I mentioned earlier, print and then star and the address, and it'll automatically dereference that address. You can also do uh, ampersands. It also knows how to point to the thing that's being pointed to by the address, as well as the address of the pointer itself. So all of those are accessible using the print command. Now, there's another command called display. And you would think that print and display sound like the same thing, um, but they're not quite the same. It turns out that when you set up a display, you are actually saying, every time I stop, show me the contents of this particular variable or structure or array, what have you. And so in GDB, in the DDD output, it'll then create a third window, which are all the things that are currently being displayed. And the neat thing about that is it will actually color code them. So if something has changed in that particular structure, it'll color code it so you can see what's changed. So you can tell it to step, 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 step. Ah, see that one turned red. Ah, okay, that got modified. So now I'll go back and take a look at why that got modified. So uh, this is kind of a nice thing. Uh, like print, it basically shows the variable. We have a format option, so we can specify it in hex, binary, whatever. And uh, every time we take a step, it'll automatically print the value. It'll update the value for you instead of having to type print every single time you get to some point where you really want to look at a variable. So definitely useful to see when a variable changes.
Now, when we're dealing with things like U-Boot, when we're dealing with places that we are actually up in the kernel, for instance, and we're looking at physical addresses, um, or even virtual addresses in this particular case, uh, we can examine memory at a particular address. So if we have a known address in memory, such as a pointer, we can display the memory at that address. We can display any arbitrary address using the X command. And in this case, we have an extra modifier here. So it's not only the type of variable, but it's also how long we want, how wide we want to print it. So I could say this is a byte decimal, and that's what this one is doing. This is a decimal uh, byte. So this is a char, for instance. That would be the equivalent of a char in C. Uh, and there's the address of the variable itself. So uh, we can do that and look at not only memory, but obviously we can also look at registers if we happen to be in a situation where we need to look at those. Okay, so setting breakpoints. Setting up breakpoints, uh, GDB has several different types of breakpoints. And they can be a little confusing, especially if you happen to be trying to debug in Flash. Um, but let's talk about the first type of breakpoint, which is just the standard breakpoint, a normal software breakpoint. What a normal software breakpoint does is it goes into your code and modifies the location that you're setting the breakpoint to to add a debug trap. And the instruction that was at that location is now stored with the breakpoint. So when I encounter that, it does the debug trap, traps back to the debugger, and then I can tell it to execute the next command and it'll automatically execute whatever instruction was at the point that I placed the breakpoint. Uh, that is, uh, of course, the problem with that is it has to be able to go out and physically modify the location in memory. That is a bit troublesome when we're dealing with NAND flash, where we can't easily go out and rewrite a byte in NAND flash. We have to read the whole sector, erase it, reprogram it, write it all back again. And if we were trying to do debugging in that particular kind of model, uh, it would burn the flash out really fast. Uh, I have done some work in China uh, with uh, some folks that used to be Motorola PCS in China, and their strategy was to debug using flash. And every time they wanted to change something, they rewrote the flash. And I asked them how long the board lasted before you burnt the flash out. And they go, ah, oh, week, 10 days. And then we send it back to manufacturing and they redo it and we get another board. Wow, okay. Um, they uh, have a temporary breakpoint, and what a T-break does is the first time you encounter it, it will break, and then it'll turn off automatically. So if I just wanted to step into this piece of code and see what the values were here, but then continue, I could use a T-break to do that. Now, H-break, those are hardware breakpoints, and hardware breakpoints are limited by your CPU architecture. So some CPU architectures have got one hardware breakpoint, some have three, some have six, just depends on the architecture. Um, with a hardware breakpoint, that's where you're gonna be debugging in flash. Because hardware breakpoints are saying, if you match this address on the bus, stop. So that's a wonderful thing to be able to go, oh, okay, yes, in this location in flash, when you see that address, stop and it doesn't actually replace anything in the flash, so you can actually use it to debug flash, and that's kind of the real advantage of these hardware breakpoints. Uh, we'll see a couple of other uses for hardware breakpoints in just a moment, because we're gonna be using them for something called a watch point. Now, uh, with, um, with all these different types of breakpoints, most of the GUI front ends typically support them, so uh, they will actually have a menu entry for that, and they may actually have a different symbol so instead of just a normal stop sign for a, a typical break, you'll actually see T stop or some other, some other symbol that will show you that it's a temporary breakpoint or a hardware breakpoint. Uh, you can also set conditional breakpoints. Now when you're dealing with conditional breakpoints, you'll say break at some line number if this condition occurs. Uh, the problem with using these conditional breakpoints is we have to evaluate the condition every time we stop. Uh, and so that means that we're going to spend, when we're, or as, as we execute. So that means as we're executing, it's checking this condition to see if something has changed. So that can slow things down depending on how many of these conditional breakpoints you have. Uh, so use them sparingly. Um, normally it's just a quick, uh, okay, I've got this loop, it runs through 10,000 entries. Uh, I wanna stop when I get to this value. 
And so that's the kind of thing you're, you're typically not going to have dozens of these conditional breakpoints active at any one point in time, but you certainly could. Now, when you get ready to set a breakpoint from the command line, it's really easy. You just type B space symbol or address or line number or file and line number, any of the things we would normally use to reference a particular line. Uh, and that will automatically generate a breakpoint. It'll put the breakpoint in that location. Now, notice here the number associated with that breakpoint. So what GDB does is it numbers the breakpoints, not the line numbers. So if I said break at line 20, that's going to be breakpoint number one. If I said break at line 37, that's going to be breakpoint number two. So you need to be able to keep track of the breakpoints. So one of the ways to keep track of the breakpoints is using the info breakpoint command. And of course, there's abbreviations for all this, just I space B. It will show you all the breakpoints that you have, their numbers, and where they are in the code. If I have a situation where when I encounter the breakpoint, I want to do something special. I want to print a variable or I want to you know, look at some other piece of code somewhere. So what we can do is we can do after break on main commands. And then it'll say, okay, type your commands. And anything that I want to do, I basically enter the commands in. And then when I'm finished, I want to type end as a single line. And that will stop that particular command. Now, from this point forward, when it encounters break at main, it's going to print F main started. And then it'll continue. So it's like putting a print statement in your code, but we're using the debugger to do it. So we're not having to go out and recompile it. We're not actually putting printfs in the code. We're allowing the debugger to run this. Now, one thing that you'll need to keep in mind, when you're dealing with multi-core, um, in many cases, we're going into multi-core using the debugger to try and find things like race conditions. But the debugger itself will perturb the timing of the code. So it's kind of like, well, if I run it in the debugger, it doesn't happen. Let's ship it with the debugger enabled. Uh, I have seen that. Uh, you don't want to do that. <laughs> but uh, you know, that is something you need to be aware of is that the, using the debugger, especially when we're talking about multi-threaded code, uh, will change the performance of the code because basically the debugger is watching what's going on here. And because it's doing that, it's going to change the timing. And if it's a very tight race condition kind of problem, it may actually make the race condition go away. Now, the race condition hasn't really gone away. We've just simply masked it with the fact that it's running a little bit slower and it doesn't happen as often. But um, it will still happen eventually. And especially after you take it out of the debugger, it'll probably happen again. So um, that's where you use other tools. Uh, it turns out uh, Helgrind out of the Valgrind suite. Uh, and it's not Valgrind, it's Valgrind as, as in the gateway to Valhalla. Uh, they, and Helgren is the gateway to the other place. Um, but uh, what these things do is Helgren specifically looks for race conditions. So you'll actually be able to run it against the code and it'll say potential race condition in line number such and such. Um, so it actually is a, is a pretty decent system and it allows it to run at pretty much full speed. Uh, so you won't get the perturbation of the uh, timing that you get out of GDB uh, when you use something like Helgrind. So there's other tools that allow you to do that kind of stuff. Now, when we get ready to step through the code, of course, when we ran DDD, you'll notice there was that little window that popped up over there. Uh, so we have the run command. And of course, that's just as you type run from the command line. Uh, in order for that button to really help us, if we happen to have a circumstance of parameters that need to be passed when we run the run command, that's where we use the set args command. So we'll do the set args command and then we can press the run button and it'll execute it. Of course, if I'm running and I just saw it do something, I didn't know what exactly what that was, I want to stop it, I can hit the interrupt button and that will stop the execution of the code wherever I hit the interrupt button. Um, so we're not, a, it's not a break point in the sense that you know exactly where it's going to stop. With the interrupt button, you saw something scroll by and you hit the, hit the interrupt button to see what it was. So it's just going to stop the code wherever you happen to be. Now, kind of the downside of this is if you happen to be in a system call or a library function that you don't have the source code to when you hit the interrupt button, you're going to be confronted with assembly language code. And you're like, oh, okay, that's not quite what I wanted. Uh, 
But it turns out they got a way to fix that problem too. We'll see that here in a second. Uh, we see the step command. A step command will step into functions. So if I'm stepping along and I have a function call that says, you know, bubble sort, and I type step, it's going to step into the bubble sort code. If I if instead I called next, next calls the bubble sort code, but doesn't actually step into it. So it's just a function call at that point. Um, the advantage is, of course, uh, when I'm stepping, uh, I have this happen all the time, I'm stepping along and I accidentally step into the printf function. Well, I'm going to assume that printf actually works, so I don't want to go through the assembly language of printf. That's kind of tedious. So they actually have a command called finish, and the finish command will then execute to the return, and so the next step will then be the next piece of code after the function call. Uh, we have uh, step i, which steps one assembly language instruction, and next i, which does the same thing, but steps over function calls. Uh, we'll talk about some of these other ones. Uh, up and down, for instance. Uh, up and down deal with stack frames. So if I have a main calling a subroutine, I can be in the subroutine and go, well, what was the variable in the stack in main? You can go up, and it'll go now up to main's stack frame. I'll be able to see the variable context there. It'll be in scope. And then I can go back down into the stack frame that I came from. Um, there also have uh, edit and make. Uh, you can actually do code editing inside of GDB, uh, like DDD here. Um, I'm not sure that, so sure that I would actually use that as an editor, but you know, when you just need to make a quick change, maybe it makes sense. And then you can invoke the make, so it'll just run what are, it'll just run make in that directory, and it'll automatically. If you've got a make file in there, it'll automatically rebuild it. And then once you've rebuilt it, it'll tell you, hey, the, the executable has changed on the disk. Would you like for me to reload? And you can certainly do that. All right. So um, we'll talk about, uh, uh, well, okay, just for yucks. Cont is continue. So if I've hit a breakpoint and I want to just tell it to continue execution, I can press the cont key. Um, if I am uh, running with multiple threads, uh, I can use the kill button, basically, to kill off a particular thread if I need to do that. Uh, all of that, of course, within the debugger. So now, uh, what if I want to attach to a running piece of code? If I want to attach to a running piece of code, then I can use the dash P option. So now I've got a piece of code that's running. I was not running it under the auspices of the debugger. But I would see it, I see it do something that I'm not quite sure what's going on there. So what I want to do is I want to attach it to the debugger while it's running. So I can do a GDB dash P and the process ID of that particular code, and now it will attach GDB and take control. So the code will stop, GDB will now be in control. If the code was compiled with debugging information, I'll see the source code. If it was not compiled with debugging information, I'll see assembly language code. So I can take over an existing application. Now this is really handy in cross debugging where I'm running an application on the target and I just saw the target's robot arm spot weld somebody. And I want to figure, hey, what happened to that? Where, where, where did that come from? Uh, let's go ahead and glom on to the application and stop it. Um, the dash P, by the way, the way GDB works with all this stuff, it uses P trace commands. So the, pos the process trace commands in the, in the operating system is how they do all this stuff. All right. Uh, now, let's assume that I have done a dash P, grabbed a process ID, and maybe the application that I just grabbed a hold of um, is not, it was compiled using a different compiler path, that is a different build uh, system. So if it was compiled, say, on the target, and I'm trying to do this on the host, then the target's directory structure may not be mirrored exactly on the host. If that's the case, then I'll need to tell the debugger where the file is located. So that's what the file command would do. I would then say file, specify where the file was located, so it can then find the debugging information, so I can then see the sources to it. Uh, there's something else I just happened to think about. Um, now it'll come back to me anyway. All right. So now, uh, what if we wanted to monitor a, a, you know, a particular application, or excuse me, monitor a variable or a data structure. And I want to be able to do something that says, if this gets changed, stop. This is kind of a classic problem that we run into. You got a variable, it's getting stepped on. Something is modifying it. A pointer, 
uh, could be a function call, could be almost anything. Something is modifying this variable, and I don't know what it is. So what I'm going to do in that case is I'm going to set a watch point on the variable. And uh, there's also some modifications to the watch point. I can specify whether I want the watch point to be there for a read or a write or both. So I have a little bit more uh, control there. But with the watch point, I can then say watch this variable or watch this address as the case may be. If anything changes it, program stops. And it'll immediately pop me to the piece of code that made the modification. So this is a way for me to find that elusive something is stepping on my variable and I'm not sure what it is kind of problem. How does it implement this? Hardware, well, hardware breakpoint. So it uses a hardware breakpoint. So you can actually use watch points in Flash. Um, I wouldn't necessarily do that, but um, because it uses a hardware breakpoint, there's no reason why it wouldn't also work in Flash. So here's an example of watch points. Uh, I've got a breakpoint here. I'm telling it to run. Uh, so it's executing, I want to do a watch on some variable called x and then tell it to continue. So I've done a, a, an interrupt here and I've gotten back out to the GDB command prompt. I then do a hardware watch point. So here it got touched, hardware watch point two, variable x. The old value was this variable, was this value. The new value is this. It was modified by main uh, at watch.c line number 10. So now I know what the old variable was, I know what the new value is, I, knew, I now know where it was modified, and so I can go take a look at that code to figure out what caused that. We can also break on events. Now events are more specific to particular languages. So when we talk about an event, uh, we're talking about like uh, C++ throw instructions, you know, catch throw kind of thing. Um, we also see ADA exceptions is another one that it understands. So it can uh, deal with an exception. It can deal with calls to fork, where I'm going to actually fork to a new application. Uh, loading shared libraries, unloading shared libraries, signals. If you get a signal, you can actually tell it to break on signal. Uh, you can also do uh, system calls. And if you want to exec, if you want to actually call exec for some reason or another, it, you can always set it to break on that. So anytime you're going to be significantly changing the state of the application, like a syscall, then you can say, set a breakpoint such that if I call a system, stop what you're doing. Because I want to take a look at the function call, I want to look at the parameters, and I want to actually step through that to see what the return is from the system call. Now, that, uh, that's, that exception thing is these things called catch points. So uh, it's a little confusing if you're interested in C++ uh, catch throw uh, exception handling. You'll actually do a catch of throw, which is kind of weird, uh, but not as weird as a catch of catch, I guess, which is another one of the ones that you can actually do. So um, they also have a T catch for a temporary catch point. So if you're just looking at this particular exception, you, you know, maybe you're calling multiple system calls and you only want to look at the first one. Then you do a t-catch and do that. So uh, deleting breakpoints. We have um, info breakpoints. That'll show me all the breakpoints that we have. Then we can do d space and the, the number of the breakpoint and it will then delete that particular breakpoint. Uh, I can clear breakpoints from functions. I can clear all breakpoints. I can uh, be very specific about which breakpoint in which file in which function in that file I want to clear. Uh, so we do have a lot of capabilities for dealing with breakpoints there. And at any point in time you're confused about breakpoints, always type help space breakpoints. And it'll then give you all the help output from uh, GDB. All right, there's some weirdness that happens. Now, um, when we're debugging, the general rule of uh, thought there is we want to debug unoptimized code. And the reason we want to debug unoptimized code is because all the instructions are actually there, all the variables are actually there, the compiler hasn't done anything special for us. Unfortunately, we don't necessarily always have that option. In some cases, when we're, especially when we're working with kernel code, we have to compile it with optimization level two, otherwise it won't inline things and do what kernel code is supposed to do. So if we do happen to be in a situation where we have to run optimized code. You can actually debug optimized code, but 
you have to be prepared for some really strange behavior. First of all, as you're stepping down through a function, the instruction pointer may actually go backwards. There may also be variables that no longer exist because the compiler has optimized them out or promoted them to be registers, as the case may be. So some of the variables that you may be looking at, maybe they don't exist in the optimized state. So you need to be uh, kind of prepared for that mentally because I've seen people who's the first time they've tried to debug optimized code, their step, 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 boo, the instruction pointer goes backwards. Hey, wait, wait a minute, what happened? There's no go to, there's nothing in here, why did it do that? And it's just because of the optimizers and they're reusing instructions and things of that sort. So technically, yeah, it looks like the instruction pointer went backwards. It really didn't, but understand that's just the representation of the way the compiler produced it. So uh, we will see some weirdness that happens every now and then on that. Uh, if we want to access local variables, we can do info space locals. That'll show us all the local variables that are within scope. Uh, we can, of course, use the up and down commands to go in and out of different scopes. We have info registers, which will then show me all the registers. I can look at a backtrace. So if I hit a breakpoint, I can then do BT, and that'll show me the backtrace of how I got to this particular breakpoint. So which functions got called to get me here. Um, I can also take a look at the current stack frame by using info frame. If you did help space info, you'll actually see a whole bunch of things that the info command can return to you. Also, when we're dealing with signals, this is another problem that happens in the user space quite a bit. Uh, we'll get a signal. Uh, maybe somebody is doing a, uh, uh, let's say, well, I could be getting a, a legitimate signal like SIG uh, FPE, a floating point error, or SIG SEGV if it's a segmentation violation. So what I want to do is I want to intercept the signal and then go take a look at what the signal would actually be doing. So we can tell it to deal with the signal and then how we want to deal with the signal. Uh, if we get the signal, don't stop. If we get the signal, do stop when the signal occurs. That also implies kind of a print as well. Uh, we can print a message when the signal occurs. Uh, we can see the signal and how it would be handled. If we wanted to actually find out about signals, we can actually uh, take a look at info signals and it'll show us this plus a whole bunch of additional information about how you are going to handle the signal. We can block signals, we can allow signals to pass. And then if we want to deliver a signal to our running application, we can just use signal and the signal we want to deliver and it will deliver the signal to us and then we can test our signal handling code. All right, so now things get really ugly. <laughs> if they weren't ugly enough. Uh, debugging threads. Of course, one of the things you have to remember about debugging threads in Linux, Linux is a one-to-one -one threading model. So that means every thread is independently schedulable across all CPU cores all the time. Unless you've specifically done hard affinity to lock it to a particular CPU core, the threads could run anywhere. Now, this is one of the things that causes so many race conditions because I have two threads, one's a priority 50 thread and one's a priority zero thread. If I was on a single processor, a unit processor, if I was running the zero thread, then that zero thread would run to completion before the 50 thread would get a chance to run. But in multi-core, I could be running the zero thread and the 50 thread at the exact same time. Conversely, I could have the expectation in a, uh, in a unit processor that if I'm running something at priority 20, priority 20 is going to run to completion before priority zero gets a chance to run. Not so in multi-core. In multi-core, they can run simultaneously. So the extensions that have been made to GDB to handle threads specifically are important anytime we're dealing with multi-threaded applications, especially on multi-core platforms, which is pretty much everything except the pocket beagle maybe. Uh, you know, there's, but there's a lot of multi-core uh, small development boards out these days. So if we're interested in finding out what threads are currently active, we'll do an info threads, and then we can select a thread by a particular ID. So the info threads will show me all the thread numbers, and I can say uh, switch to thread number three, and let's take that one. So we can also restrict breakpoints to a particular thread. So normally breakpoints are global. If you encounter that location in memory from any thread, it will stop the thread, uh, actually stop everything. Uh, 
Uh, now, in this particular case, what we want to do is we want to restrict the breakpoint to a particular thread. So we're going to do breakpoint, whatever the breakpoint we want, the thread and the thread ID, um, and that will then cause it to break only that thread if it's encountered by that thread. Uh, we also want to, in some cases, restrict the thread execution to just the current thread. So if I'm trying to debug a thread, and I'm stepping down through the thread, I don't want to suddenly do a context switch to another thread. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to set scheduler locking on, and that's equivalent of the big kernel lock of the old days. So it's going to shut off the scheduler. I will not switch over to the other threads. I'm just going to be able to step through this existing thread. So whichever scenario you happen to run into, um, this is a really handy way of being able to control which thread you're looking at. So if you didn't turn the scheduler lock on and you had a breakpoint in a particular thread, it's only going to stop that particular thread. The other threads could keep Correct. being scheduled. And, and so what will happen, though, is you're, you hit the breakpoint and you get ready to step and then suddenly you've switched to a different thread. Right. And now you're looking at a completely different piece of code. So yeah, it can get really confusing if you don't do the set scheduler on business. So um, and there's also, I mean, here's something else you can do, for instance. You can set a command up so that when you hit the breakpoint, it immediately sets the scheduler off. So you wouldn't have to actually sit there and type it. So that's another one of the automation capabilities that we have in GDB that are uh, really handy to have. Now, uh, we're gonna, we've now basically covered the, ma the, the, the I don't wanna say the, ma the, the, the most, we have not covered all of GDB by any stretch of the imagination. But we've covered most of the things you will use on a day-to-day -day basis. Now we're going to take a look at something special that GDB does, and that is debugging core dumps. Now, uh, those of you who are old enough to remember old IBM mainframes, um, we, when we're running on a mainframe, if we had a core dump, it would be core dump, ab end, abnormal end, core dump follows. So we see ab end, core dump follows, and then a whole box of paper would be printed uh, because that would be all the hex that was actually it was EPSIDIC of uh, the application that we were trying to run. Uh, that, of course, was not terribly useful. So by default, they turn off core dumps in Linux. So if we want to be able to re-enable core dumps, we actually have to take advantage of something called the ulimit command. And the ulimit command will allow us to set the size of a core file. Now you can also do ulimit-c unlimited, in which case it doesn't have any limit to how much memory it'll take up. But what this is doing here is when we get a core file, and look, my, it overlapped my screen, oh well. Oh. Uh, when we get a core file, it's going to take a snapshot of memory. And that means the registers, the local variables, the stack variables, the globals, everything. It's going to take a complete snapshot of that and write it off to disk in a file called core. So when it does that, we can then use GDB to load that core file and see where it was when it aborted. And we'll actually, actually also see a case where you may want to cause it to generate a core file, but not stop running. So there are going to be some things that you can do with that too, and I'll show you how that works. So the core file, the reason that this is by default turned off is because if you do have a core dump, it's going to take up a lot of space on the disk. And they, they refer to these as like core droppings, so those animal droppings and core droppings. And uh, it gets to be a nuisance to try and find the core droppings and delete them. So by default, they're automatically turned off. Uh, we can turn them on. We can turn them on per shell. So whatever application I'm running, whatever shell I'm running this in. So I would do um, you know, ulimit-c unlimited and then run the application in the shell that I just typed that in, and that would then turn off, uh, turn off the limits for core dumps. So we would actually be able to do a core dump in that case. Yeah, I have a question. So you're just dumping your right. Just dump, yeah, the question is, is it just dropping your process, dumping your process memory? The answer is yes. Question. Yeah, run. Quick, quick, let's go back and forth to see how fast Bayon can run. <laughs> So when you run the when you run ulimit-c and give it give it a number that does that automatically 
you mean that a program will will create a core dump if it crashes, or do you still have to? It depends on the type of crash. So we'll see here in just a minute. Some crashes cause core dumps and some do not. But we can always force a core dump if we really need to. Okay. Uh, you're not far enough. You, you have to go over there because we need Dan to run across that way. No, no, no. He, he, had, he had a question there. Wouldn't you, wouldn't you uh, be more accurate to say that you have to set the U limit as the parent of the process that you want to have uh, the core generated? Because if you do it at that level, you could have a, a system process or something like that you're trying to get to. Do uh, well, what change. happens, yeah, so what happens when you run the U limit command, it's shell specific. So if I'm running an application, obviously I'm going to launch it from the shell. So I'm going to do a U limit dash C in that shell, and then anything that I run in that shell will be uh, will have this U limit uh, opposed, uh, applied to it. Now the max core file size is actually specified in disk sectors, which are 512 bytes per sector in the way GDB calculates them. So even though we now have disk sectors that are 4K bytes disk sectors, the big sectors. Um, it still calculates them all in 512 byte sectors. So uh, we have, uh, you know, in, in many cases we'll just do core dump dash C unlimited because we don't want to sit there and kind of think, well, how much memory does this thing actually take? Uh, that it, it hurts the brain. Yeah, question. Is there a benefit to doing a core dump uh, versus an overall kernel dump uh, besides perhaps like space? Space is the big one. I mean, obviously, if you try to do a complete memory dump of everything, then where was the thing you're trying to find? Uh, you know, if you've got 64 gigs of RAM in your x86-64, that's a lot of space. So yeah, it's, it's usually we're going to focus on taking a core dump of the application that we're trying to test here. Um, and then there's a different core dump mechanism in the kernel. So we have LKCD, we have KDump, there's several different uh, alternatives up in the kernel for doing just the kernel memory. But this is typically focusing on an application in user space. Question. <laughs> Go ahead, run, run, run. Oh. The other co uh, comment I wanted to make is you also have to be careful of some distributions because they may re-divert your core to something else and so you have to go through some extra well and and we'll see here in just a second there's a proc file system entry that you can turn on to control some of that so uh, checking the core dump settings we just do a u limit dash a this shows me the core file size and this is the default in most shells it sets up as zero um, and then this of course is other things we can specify stack sizes and that kind of stuff so there's a lot of stuff that is actually buried in u limit and this is one of those cases where I wish we could talk a little bit more about all this stuff, but unfortunately we don't have time. All right, so uh, we can turn on PID-centric files. So if we go into Proxys kernel, core uses PID, and you set a one in there, then what it's gonna do is every time you get a core dump, it's gonna have core dot and the process ID associated with it. So this is useful if I have multiple applications that are communicating with each other, like in ROS, for instance, where we're trying to do a robotic uh, application. If you've got multiple applications that are communicating with each other and suddenly a whole bunch of them core dump at once, we want to be able to keep them straight. We don't want to have everybody have the file core because now which core is it? Which application was it that actually produced that core? So with the uh, core uses PID, it'll simply stick the PID number out there and that'll allow us to keep them straight. Now, once we get ready to use the core file, uh, we'll call GDB, application name, of course we can do DDD, that works too, uh, dash core and core file. Now, in the case of DDD, they actually have a button that allows you to load a core file separately. So if you loaded the application into DDD and you go, oh, I got a core file, I forgot to put that on the command line, then you can just click on a menu entry and it'll allow you to specify the core file. So. You don't have to do it all at front, but uh, that's typically how you would do it anyway. Now, here's an example. We have an application that produces a core dump here, and we've got some global variables. Uh, we have an application that's doing some computing here. Uh, we're doing some division, a few other things, and then we're going to return. So this is a relatively ill-behaved application. So uh, what we want to do here is we want to, oh, th and by the way, th this is the first part of the application, and then it calls a function called compute it, and the compute it value comes in, 
and we say uh, we have a volatile here, we're declaring it, we're doing a divide here, and then um, we're going to be doing some additional checking to see if we've got a floating point error or a segmentation violation. So uh, let's go ahead and take a look at what this looks like when you run it. Uh, we'll compile it, well, then we're still using dash G3, of course we could have just used dash G for this particular application. We execute it, and when we execute it, it'll then say, oh, well, here's the first, oh, oh, core dump. And now that we got a core dump out there, we can then load it into the core, into the GDB. And when we load it into GDB, uh, it comes back and says, oh, well, okay, I can't find the path name for this particular application. We can take care of all that. But we see the core was generated by Apple app one, terminated with signal 11, segmentation fault, and then it shows me the line of code where it terminated. And we see that, what is that? It's a null pointer. So in this case, we had a null pointer that caused it. Um, there's a couple of cases in the, in the actual code in the lab. Uh, what we have is, uh, we can have it generate a floating point error, or we can have it generate a general segmentation violation. And so in the lab, you can actually see what both of those look like when they happen, and uh, then load them into GDB accordingly. But this gives you a lot of information. I mean, this tells you the line that it happened on. And you can look at it and go, oh yeah, that's a null pointer. Yeah, that's probably what the problem is. Now, uh, we can also examine the core file for additional information. First of all, we can do info locals. That will show us all the local variables. We can see what the pointer was pointing to, and it, obviously this is an x86-64 because it's pointing off into La La Land and the 7F bajillion addresses. Um, we have info frame, so it'll show us the uh, stack frame that we're working on right now. Source language is C. Argument list is at that location. What are the arguments? Number one is 20, number two is four. Uh, locals in the previous frame, we see the registers. We can actually dump the registers if we want to do that. So all that information is available to us from the core file. Now uh, here's another example, info registers. We're going to dump all the registers out of it. And obviously this one is a magic x86. It actually has all of 15 of the registers. So we're not just AX, BX, CX, DX. We actually have R7 through R15 as well. Um, and uh, that, of course, is useful if you uh, can, of course, understand exactly what the hell all these numbers mean. Um, but we see, you know, these are all up on the stack somewhere. Uh, so that's pretty high stuff, and that's where the stack lives in the x86. Info stack, we can take a look at what's on the stack. Uh, we can also look at all defined variables. We have int, divide, sum, and value. We can then see what their values are. We can look at non-debugging symbols, things that were introduced by the C runtime environment. Uh, or that were introduced by various constructors and destructors. There happen to see a destructor index. We have error no being defined here. Um, and it turns out because there are multiple uh, extra applications, there's another error no sitting out there. So we can actually see all of that too. Now, the thing to remember about core dumps, they're great, but the key characteristic of the core dump is it is post-mortem. You cannot continue debugging with a core dump. It's only going to tell you what happened, and then you can go, okay, well, let me instrument the code to try and see, and then run it in the debugger again, but this is only post-mortem, so you're not going to be able, you'll be able to look at all the values, but you're not going to tell it to step or next or any of that sort of business, because it's really not running. It's really just showing you the state of the application at the time that it failed. So now, um, cross-debugging. So that, with all that background, now we're going to see how this is different when we start doing cross debugging. And it turns out that the good part is it's not really all that different. So even if we have a situation where we have a remote target and we're trying to do cross debugging to the remote target, um, we can uh, run GDB and DDD on the host. So we have advantage of the GUI and all that sort of good stuff. And then we can target, we can actually run the application on the target itself and step down through it. So I have now two machines. I have the target machine, which is running the code, and I have the host machine, which is running the debugger, and the two of them are connected with each other. So uh, as we indicated a little bit earlier, we saw the dash debugger option in DDD, which is gonna tell us that we're using an alternative debugger. 
we can debug ARM code from the x86, but what we're going to have to do here is we're going to have to use a special command at the GDB command line called target remote. And we're going to specify what kind of remote we're talking to. Because we can talk to serial ports, we can talk to uh, TCP, UDP, lots of different options in this target remote command. So the dwarf debug format doesn't change because we're using a different sort of processor architecture. So dwarf is dwarf, whether you're x86 or PowerPC or ARM or whatever. So the nice thing about that is we can load the code to de be debugged into the local GDB session. So we've compiled the code using the cross compiler. It has the dash G option turned on it. So when we load that into our debugger, we're seeing all the symbols, all the debug symbols, all the line numbers and all that good stuff. But the code that runs on the target doesn't need that. I just need to be able to make sure that the code that's running in the debugger and the code that's running on the target are the same code, that they haven't been modified in some way from one version to the other. So I compile it twice, basically. I can compile it without debugging, and that gets copied over to the target. I can co uh, compile it with debugging, that gets loaded to GDB. Now I make, make a connection between the two of them and I can actually debug non-debug code on the target. Now, why would you do that? Uh, because of the amount of memory that those things can take up. If I'm running on really, really, okay, re really, really tiny memory footprints, then I may not necessarily have enough memory for all this debug code that's sitting out there. Yeah, question. So you, you said we had to compile twice. Is it also okay to compile once with debugging and then use strip? Yes, you can certainly do that. And um, the, the, the goal here is just to make sure, you know, when you run strip, you're basically stripping all the debug symbols off. So that's the other thing to do. You can compile it and then run strip, load the stripped version over onto the target, and the non-stripped version is what you run in the debugger. Of course, because of the way ptrace, the process trace mechanism works, um, it's going to run the same whether I'm running under ARM or I'm running under x86, so that doesn't change either. So what we have to do is we have to have a communications mechanism between the host and the target. So on the host, we'll have the host OS, GDB, DDD sitting on top of that. On the target, we actually have a little thing called a helper. This is called GDB server. And we can then connect either via RS-232 or using uh, Ethernet. So let's take a look at that. Um, the remote, when we do a target remote command, we have the option of specifying it as a serial port. So if we're doing slash TTYS0, we can actually also specify a baud rate. So we can do 115.2, whatever that is. And that will allow us to connect over a serial port. It turns out that's what you do when you're talking to KGDB. So the kernel GDB talks only over the serial port. Now, on the other hand, if I have a target like the Beagle, and I'm connected using a USB serial, uh, excuse me, a USB network interface, then it looks just like a normal TCP network. So I can use the network option. I can also go direct hardware communications. I can talk to a JTAG and do it that way as well. So it is possible to use that non-debug enabled code. We only need to make sure we know where the code that has the debugging information in it is so we can load it into the debugger on the host. Uh, now, here's an example of a cross debug. On the target, I'm going to run GDB server. So GDB server is another application. It's tiny. It's only like 7K bytes in size. It's really a small application, so it doesn't take up a lot of space. Uh, GDB server, we have the IP of ad address of the GDB debugger. So where is the debugger going to come from? In this case, on the pocket beagle, it's 192.168.7.1 colon port number. Now, obviously, you want to pick a port number that isn't currently in use. Uh, so it just so happens a good friend of mine uh, always picks 1929 because that's when the stock market crashed and nobody uses that number. It's bad juju. Don't want to do that. All right, so uh, here we've got our GDB server. We specify the application that we want to run, and we'll put it in background. Now, why put it in background? Because frequently when I'm talking to a debug target, a target that I'm working with, I may only have one connection. I may have a serial port. And if I don't put it in background, I don't get the serial port back. So I will occasionally, you'll basically put it in background as kind of a rule of thumb. And that way you don't have to open up a second SSH or open up a second serial port or something like that to it. And then on the host, 
I'll specify target, remote, and this is the Beagle Bones, or the, 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 the Pocket Beagles address, 7.2, and of course, colon and the actual port number that I specified up here. Now, what's going to happen is, as soon as it attaches, I will get a message that says, attach to process ID such and such. So now I am in the uh, actual, in the application. So now what the GDB server does is it runs the application to get past the uh, C runtime. So you can pass parameters here as well, and it'll then hit a breakpoint at main, basically. So when you connect to it, it's already running. So this is one of those cases where I can't tell GDB to run the application because it's already running. It's running under the auspices of the GDB server. So what I'm going to tell it to do is I'm going to set my breakpoints and I'm going to tell it to continue. And then it'll be able to continue running. But again, any parameters that I pass on the command line uh, will be passed to the application. It'll run through the C runtime. Our argc argv will already be decoded. That'll already be in memory. So I'm now at the breakpoint at main, and I can then start debugging from there. Yeah. Yep. So that way someone else can't. Correct. You can't have somebody program. doing mind games with you and usurping your GDB session. That would be, it would be interesting. It would really be interesting to be able to do that, but no. They, they actually then say, okay, it's only going to accept a connection from this IP address at that port number. I take it the protocol is also unencrypted, so, it's, so there's some security in that, but you can't, you can't fully rely on it. No, no. So, I mean, the, the protocol here is going to be basically open going across TCP. And there is an option. Uh, we can actually specify this. Instead of it being a TCP, we can actually specify it as a UDP interface if we want to do that, um, especially in cases where it's difficult to maintain a TCP connection for whatever reason. We can just do it with UDP packets back and forth. Uh, the GDB server can also attach to a running application. So I can tell it to uh, look for this host IP at this port number and attach to this process ID. And it'll grab a hold of the process ID and stop it and then wait for the GDB session to connect to it. So it won't go anywhere. The application is basically stopped at that point. Um, this also works with GUI-based front ends. So uh, with DDD, we can specify it on the command line. And when we get into the actual debugger, we can go into GDB itself at the command line and specify what my IP address and port number is. So when I do my target remote, if we take a look, we see, uh, whoops, wrong way there. Uh, we see there's a serial port. Uh, this is a typical serial port in Linux. Here's an example of an IP address for TCP. Here is the UDP, how you reference it with UDP. You just put UDP on the front of it. Um, we can also, if we really want to, we can actually see all the packets going back and forth. So if we do set debug remote one, that will then show all the packets between the GDB agent and the GDB debugger. So if you really wanted to see all that stuff, if you didn't want to run Wireshark, which you could do that, um, then you could always turn it on here inside of the debugger. So now running the program, again, as I mentioned, you're already running. You basically stopped at main, so you're going to tell it to continue after you've set your breakpoints. Uh, you can look at the arguments. You can do show arguments. You can set arguments. You can change that depending on what you may need. So all that works. Now, we take that concept and we extend it a little bit, and this is how you do debugging with the kernel. So for many years, Linus fought against having a source debugger in the kernel. His comment was, if you can't debug with printk, you shouldn't be in the kernel. And there was a big flame war that happened about that, and uh, you know, basically he says, yeah, if you can't figure out how to do it with printk, yeah, you probably shouldn't be writing kernel code. Um, fortunately, calmer heads prevailed, and uh, late in the 2.6 kernel series, they actually added KGDB Lite. So the original KGDB was a pretty heavyweight application. It actually modified like 300 different files. And that was Linus's complaint. It touched too many files to make it really usable. And it had all kinds of features. You could do KGDB over Ethernet, KGDB over USB, and all kinds of crazy options. And uh, it just got too unwieldy. So Linus said, well, if you want to add it to your kernel, it's a patch. You could bring it down and patch for your particular version of the kernel, but I'm not having it in the main line. 
Uh, however, some folks at Wind River and another individual that worked together uh, came up with KGDB Lite. KGDB Lite only touches like 50 files, and it actually got mainlined. So now every version of the kernel since about 2627 or so had, oh no, I think it was 2632, it's in there, right? It was in the 26 kernel series. Um, some, uh, you know, every kernel since then has KGDB. Now, in order to turn on KGDB, we need to compile the kernel with debug information. And again, remember that when we compile the kernel with debug information, the debugger stuff adds about 30% to the size of the kernel. Uh, again, just like we've seen before, we don't actually have to debug the debug version of the kernel. We just need to make sure that we have access to that before uh, it, with the debugger before we actually start a debug session. We'll also want to save off a couple of other files that get created during the kernel build, one called VM Linux, the other called system.map. System.map is a listing of all of the symbols that were visible at compile time for the kernel. So any statically linked device drivers will have their symbols visible in system.map. Dynamically loaded device drivers, on the other hand, kernel loadable modules don't show up because they weren't present at the time the map was created. So there's a slight problem with that. We'll see what that is in a moment. There's a good solution for it. So here's an example. This happens to be for the two, excuse me, the 4.14.8 kernel, so a relatively recent kernel. Um, we have the option here to turn on KGDB, and we have uh, use KGDB over serial console. So one of the other problems with the original KGDB was that it was limited to the 8250 UART and its clones. So if you had a 16550, 16450, or 8250 UART, it worked fine. So if you're running it on a PC, it worked. If you're running on any other platform, it didn't work. So uh, with the way they've done it now with KGDB over serial console, it then means if you have a serial console, you can run KGDB. Now, the interesting thing about this is you think, well, what about all that serial stuff that's printing on the console? Doesn't that get in the way? Um, it turns out no, because when you turn on KGDB, it encapsulates all that stuff and sends it to the debugger. So the debugger can actually display everything that you would normally see on the console, just as you would see it on the console, but in the meantime, it also has the debugger traffic that's going back and forth. So it doesn't interfere with each other. We see another thing out here. Um, we have KGDB underscore KDB. KDB is the kernel debug. Now, KDB is not related to KGDB. It's not related to GDB in any way. It is another debugger interface, which is really a symbolic disassembler. So if you are comfortable dealing with assembly language, symbolic disassemblers are great because you can set breakpoints on printf, and then it stops at printf, and you see the assembly language output for printf. But if you're at a point where you really need to debug something in the kernel, and you can't bring KGDB up for whatever reason, you can bring KDB up, and then you can interact with it. So if you get a kernel oops or a kernel panic, it'll trap back to KDB, and you'll be able to sit there and talk to it. It's got about uh, 60 or so different commands that work in KDB. If you're interested in that, I've got some presentations that are up on YouTube, I think, on KDB. Um, but it's definitely handy to have. Uh, I've done some debugging of Android phones where the only interface they had was a serial port that I was able to trick the phone into believing it had a serial port through the audio channel, weird stuff. But um, it was then, uh, uh, I was able to fool it into thinking it had a serial port, in which case I was now able to run KDB and sit there and do some kernel debugging in the Android kernel. And sorry to say, but Ben, uh, there's another question. <laughs> uh, actually, it was, um, wasn't the Nexus 4, it was a Samsung, it was a Samsung device. Uh, but it was one of the ones that was using um, uh, the, uh, um, Qualcomm chipset, and the Qualcomm, Qualcomm chipset, you can trick it into thinking there's a serial port on the audio line. Yeah, I've gotten that to work with the Nexus 4. You have to, you have to build a little circuit with a voltage divider. Yeah, yeah, a little voltage divider. And then uh, you can do that, uh, sometimes, sometimes it goes through the audio line, sometimes it goes through the serial port, I mean through the USB charger. And if it sees a particular voltage on the USB charger, then it says, oh, I'm a serial port. And it switches to serial port mode. Uh, lots of stupid Android tricks. All right, so now a uh, typical lash up that we would see with KGDB. We have our host, 
we have the target, we may have a network going here. The Ethernet is not involved in KGDB. It's all over the serial port. So we use the target remote command on the host. We do target remote and slash dev slash TTYS zero, the baud rate, et cetera. What's going to happen when, the, uh, uh, when everything's connected, you're going to start the kernel up. And if the kernel sees that KGDB is active, it's going to stop early in the, deep, uh, early in the um, it'd be just after uh, the system, the, the, when it switches over to C, basically it stops very early there. Uh, this is like early print K, if you've ever used early print K, but now you've got a debugger attached at early print K time. And so you can actually step through the initialization of statically linked device drivers, uh, all the initialization of multi-core, all that sort of stuff, you can actually step through it in GDB. So what will happen is the kernel will start, see that it's running KGDB and stop, and you'll see it spit out a little blurb of uh, GDB gobbledygook across the screen as you're looking at the serial port. You then take the serial port and you plug it into uh, GDB, and you use your target remote on the GDB side and it'll connect, and once it connects, now you're sitting at the kernel and the kernel is stopped. So you can set breakpoints and then tell it to continue and let it run, especially if you're seeing a, a kernel oops or kernel panic during the boot time. Uh, kernel panic in a statically linked device driver is really difficult to deal with. So being able to stop it, set breakpoints, and then tell it to continue uh, is just marvelous. So uh, adding device driver symbols. Now, what if we're trying to debug a loadable device driver? If we've got a loadable, kernel loadable module and we want to try and load that in, the problem is that the uh, symbol table of the VM Linux that we compiled doesn't have the kernel loadable module symbols in it. So how do I get access to those symbols so I can set breakpoints and start working with the debug? So uh, what we end up doing is in order to debug that loaded module, we tell the debugger where the module is in memory. How do we know where it is in memory? Well, it turns out there's two places, either in slash proc slash modules, or we go into system, sys module, module name sections. If you CD into that directory and do an LS, there's nothing there. You go, well, there's nothing here. It turns out everything has got a dot in its name, so it's invisible. So if you did an ls-la, you'd see dash dot text, dash ro data, you know, you see all these symbols out there. And so you have to know that it's uh, dot text, so you can figure out what the actual address is. And then once you know what that address is, you'll do an add symbol file in the GDB command. You'll specify the object module of the driver that you're trying to load, not the dot ko, but the actual o, and the address that it's loaded at. And then once we have that, now GDB knows about it. Um, there is a case where I want to debug the very first startup, the actual init module code inside of a uh, driver. So how do I get to that? If you need to debug the underbar underbar init code, then we need to go into the load module function and set a breakpoint there. So it turns out that around line 3438 of module.c in, in the 414 kernel, we see something that looks like this. And remarkably enough, that line, not at the same location, but that line of code has been in the kernel for over a decade. And if you set a breakpoint there, then what it's going to do is it's going to call the module init function. So if you set a breakpoint there, you can now step into the module init code before the driver actually runs. So this is really handy if you have a, a driver that's crashing in the initialization. Of course, if you can't get the initialization right, maybe you shouldn't be writing drivers in the first place because it really doesn't do anything other than register itself with the kernel. Now, putting on my Linus hat, if you can't get the init running, you shouldn't be in the kernel in the first place. We can then add additional breakpoints once we've got the module, the symbol table loaded. We can set breakpoints and other breakpoints typically syssync, panic, and oops enter. Um, those are typically the ones you're going to play with. Now, syssync is one that's not quite intuitively obvious. Why would you set a break on the, sys, on the sync command? Because then from the command line in user space, I type the command sync, traps to the debugger. So now I have control of it from user space, which is kind of cool. Uh, 
Don't have to generate an interrupt or anything crazy like that. You just type the command sync and wham, I'm in the debugger. Kind of cool. All right. Now, when you hit the breakpoint, debugger is going to drop into the source code and you're going to start single stepping. So if you compiled the kernel with symbol, with debugging symbols on, then all modules that you build against that same kernel will also have debugging turned on. So that's how you make sure that you've got the debuggers enabled. Wow, okay, so that was a lot. And I appreciate you not passing out. It's embarrassing and on video when too many people pass out. Um, <laughs> but at this point, you should be pretty well aware of the kinds of things you can do in GDB. Now, um, just remember, if you don't put the bugs in the code to begin with, you don't have to get them out later. So then using GDB becomes less of a problem. But assuming that the bugs sneak in when you're not looking, then we do have a way of being able to debug all of that. Um, now, what we have is uh, we are, we got, oh wow, 10 minutes. Uh, no, so I, I, this is the first time I presented this particular material. So I think maybe the next time I'll just simply cut off the kernel piece of it. Um, but I didn't want to cheat anybody because you read the, uh, you know, you read the abstract. It says he's going to talk about the kernel. I didn't want to cheat anybody out of that. Um, what we have, if you go out to the, if you do the updater script, you're going to be able to pull down the code and the lab book and, of course, a copy of these charts as well. Uh, you'll be able to bring all that down onto your, onto your uh, uh, USB stick. Um, here's the thing. Uh, first of all, I'm still working on the lab book. So the steps work, but the screenshots don't, are just bogus. Because the screenshots were made for a target that used an NFS mounted file system. And unfortunately, we don't have the NFS code here in the Pocket Beagle to be able to do that. So uh, understand that the screenshots of GDB uh, will kind of show you sort of what you should be seeing, but the instructions are correct. So the instructions should work fine, just ignore the screenshots. Yeah. So actually, uh, you can, we can actually do NFS uh, over USB. Uh, we just uh, didn't have that all ready for, uh, for the for Well, the I, yeah, I know you, know you could. It was just, yeah. did we have all the packages and everything installed to be able to do it? So. The theoretically, yes. In, in practice, the, the how-to is uh, we ran out of time for. So um, indeed, I will point out that, that as we update these, uh, these slide decks and the code, in, in fact, they will still be on the website. And again, as Mike said, the updater will allow you to, in fact, reauthor your USB key as you go forward. So, yeah. Uh, Would it work with SSHFS? Maybe. I've never tried it. That will, that will work out a lot. Yeah. Well, yeah. It, it, yeah. There, there's sometimes some, some weirdness maybe. that happens there. Yeah, yeah. Some, yeah, there's some weird stuff with HSA, SSHFS, but it might work. So I would say try it and let us know. There you go. That would be cool. Patches accepted. Yes. Question. Any tips on multi-core issues? Any tips on Avoid multi-core like the plague. No, no. If you're trying to debug code, multi-core makes it really complicated. Single core, it works fine. Yeah. A multi-core, it's almost always race conditions. And that's where you use the info threads. and You start setting breakpoints in individual threads. Um, realize that in multi-core, because it is a one-to-one -one scheduling model, any thread can run any time on any core. Unless you use task set and uh, hard affinity. Any other questions? Woohoo! Oh, no, we almost got out. Okay. Just a point on the uh, on the multi-core debugging or threading debugging. If you don't lock the scheduler and you're stepping through your thread, you have no guarantee on the number of instructions those other threads are executing in the background. That's correct. Yep. And and so you're way out of sync. And so you may get strange results. But oftentimes what that means is the application runs just fine <laughs> because the debugger has perturbed the timing just enough that everything, that the race condition goes away. It's that classic, oh, you see that printf statement? Never remove it. That's the kind of thing we're talking about here. Eisenbugs. Yeah, that's right. Okay, that's it. Thank you.